you've landed inside Launch Street, the business innovation podcast, where we interview top innovators out there shaking things up so you can innovate, differentiate, and get further, faster. Since you're here, we know you're the type of person that recognizes the importance of unlocking your innovation advantage so you can compete and win. And now, your host, the person that has worked with leading companies like Disney, Procter & Gamble, Aero Electronics, the U.S. Army Research Labs, and Red Robin on upping their innovation advantage, Tamara Gontor. Hey, hey, all you everyday innovators. Everyday innovator Tamara here and your host of Inside Long Street. I am very eager to dig into this podcast today with my good friend and business colleague, Maureen, around how to tap the power of innovation to build a high-performing team. Sounds familiar? Well, that's because this is part two of the interview on this topic. Our conversation was so rich in content and frankly, took us so long because there was so much we wanted to cover that we broke it into two parts. As I mentioned before, we discuss everything from how to tap diversity of thinking on the team at the cognitive level deep down vulnerability, we cover failure, why all of that really matters, how to build a robust team that thinks through ideas and solutions from all different perspectives, and what leaders do right and wrong when building a high-performing team, and really how to sustain it, because it's one thing to launch, it's another thing to keep it going. So when you're done listening, go to Amazon and get the book, Innovation is Everybody's Business. That's what this conversation is all centered around. We have the hardcover and the Kindle now released. Woohoo! Now, as I mentioned before, some of you asked if you could get bulk orders for your team, maybe even get them signed. The answer is absolutely yes. Just call or email me at Launch Street. The phone number and email are in the show notes. And the publisher, I've been working with them, have graciously offered to give people that I'm directly connected to my author's discount. That's you. So pick up the phone or email me and let's get you that discount. All right, before I get to the interview, one last shout out to Maureen Berkner Boyd. This is her final interview with me. Um, and she's just this incredible business leader. And I believe in abundance for all. So I want to tell you about her because if you have the need for diversity and inclusion in your company, reach out to her. Her website link is in the show notes. Her stuff is incredibly well designed, it's highly engaging. And most importantly, it works. I have seen the results with the company she works for, it's phenomenal. Okay, Maureen Mo, as I like to call her, Berkner Boyd, is the founder of the Moxie Exchange, a company dedicated to unleashing human potential at work. Moxie's digital training, micro-learning courses, and the first-of-its-kind everyday inclusion app are used around the globe to interrupt bias and build inclusion. Mo holds a master's degree in organizational development and is the author of Rock Your Moxie, Power Moves for Women Leading the Way. I actually think I am referenced in her book, so how cool is that? Uh, Her Disrupt HR Talk, Hack Your Biased Brain, is one of the most popular talks of the movement. Okay, now on to part two of building high-performing teams and the power of innovation. Let's get to it. There's a there's a, a level of vulnerability and trust and psychological safety um, that matters in all of this. 100%. Right? We talk about if people are walking around being very polite. Yes. To one another. Oh, I have a story for you on that. Yeah, like that's just not getting you there. They're, you're <laughs> certainly not going to, right? Like people are not going to bring their A game. They're not going to be willing to take those even what uh, small risks, right? No. Like to put themselves out there. So I, I love this whole concept because I think it always starts with us individually, yes. understanding ourselves and then understanding others and how you can build on that. Right. You know, it's, um, we're tribal. But we've made the mistake in modern days of thinking that tribal means a bunch of people like me and we hang out together, right? That's birds of a feather and that will kill innovation, productivity, all of it. What tribal really means, right? If we looked back into the tribal days, it is a bunch of people who have different skills yes. that come together to make the tribe thrive. Yep. So one person's a hunter, one person's a gatherer, one person builds the houses, one person tends a garden, right? Like everybody has something they bring, but we all have to value what the other person brings. And that's what my client in the fast food was telling me that they never had that level of valuing each other because they just didn't get it. Right. They right. just, they, didn't well, they were just getting pissed off at each other. Yeah. <laughs> and once you get to that place, like you got to take a pause and go, wait a minute. I'll tell you just a funny story that I, I talk about in my book. Um, and I go deeper here, but I'll give you the reader's digest version. So I, I had this client who's a, a soda company, right? Beverage. 
And um, they had gone to this habit to create a more inclusive environment. You're going to laugh out loud when you hear this. I'm not sure I've ever told you the story of having to start comments with certain phrases to make it more okay to the person on the other side. So for example, if I didn't agree with you, instead of saying, Maureen, I don't agree, blah, 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 I would need to say, I have a clarifying question. You see where I'm going, right? So if I didn't think something made sense, I would have to say, um, let me play devil's advocate for a moment, like to justify having a different opinion. Oh my God. So, so they sanitize the crap out of things. Yes. And totally everything. disingenuous oh my God. conversation it was horrible. versus so, going there. <laughs> so I'm in a meeting with them, right? I, I was brought in as this like innovator to poke the bear in this brainstorm they were having. Somebody else is leading it. And this person leading it is internal. So they are all on board with the sanitization of all the language, right? So we've got like 20 people in the room. So imagine for a minute, we have 20 brilliant people around the room that we could really be tapping into and getting some work done. And they are forced into this. I have a clarifying polite. question. It's very Let polite. me just play devil's advocate, not because I don't disagree, even though I, I do, because my face says it, but I can't say it, well, right? And because I just used that phrase, which we all know means I disagree. Right, oh, so God, it's like a double painful. whammy. So when I would hear someone say, I have a clarifying question, actually I'd go into fight or flight because I knew that what that really meant is I have, don't agree with anything you're saying tomorrow. And then in my head, it was worse, <laughs> right? They may have just had a question, but in my head, I was like, they hate me. So, so we go through this entire day like this, and all the ideas that we have on the board are average at meh, best. Yeah, meh, meh. Right? That's, what, that's what I should have titled them all, meh. So we're out to dinner that night. Now, it's not my job. I'm not the facilitator to like halt things. So I'm doing my best to keep my mouth shut, but I'm, I'm dying. And, and you know what? Everybody else is dying. So we're out to dinner and I'm sitting next to some clients. And I was like, so how do you feel today went, right? I don't want to assume I know how maybe they thought it was brilliant. And one of them goes, it would be nice if we could speak our minds. I mean, I know Greg comes from a different perspective. So why do I have to pussyfoot around the fact that he's going to argue with me, argue away? Like they were desperate for real conversation that tapped the diversity of thinking in the room. But as leaders, we sometimes create, you know, in an effort to try to be inclusive, again, in air quotes on that one, we create this culture that actually kills it. So it's well, not inclusive at all. At all. It's the opposite, right? It's yes. the opposite. So, so then we get mad because there's group think. Well, there's group think because we forced it as leaders. Yes. So, and my work and, and your work is really around, right, how do we remove those invisible barriers that are killing the diversity in the group? And how do we give people tools to actually unlock it? And maybe it's uncomfortable sometimes. And, oh, and maybe messy, like and messy right? Yeah, and that's maybe how you know your arguments. Actually, yeah, that's how yeah. you know you're actually getting there, right? And in this with the absolute foundation of respect and trust. Yeah, right. So this team probably could have respected and trusted each other, but the barriers were so high that you just couldn't get there, right? It's just not happening with the layers that they put on from a cultural perspective. And, you know, oftentimes when we work with clients, and I know you do this too, we set that expectation in the beginning that, hey, you know what? If there are moments where you get angry or things are frustrating or you're uncomfortable, that's okay, that's gonna happen. So this is not a session where, you know, oftentimes I think with innovation in particular, we think, oh my God, we're all going to get together and brainstorm. It'll be all about scented markers. It'll be so much fun and everyone's going to be laughing and we're going to do improv all day. But it's not. It's work. Mm -mm. And it is fun and rewarding in a different way, but it's not about that, right? It is about, well, go ahead. Yeah. And I, would, and I would say, if you're not experiencing that. You're doing uh, something wrong. There's something wrong. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I'm going to actually uh, throw a little twist in here because mm. it, um, it leads me to the question. Um, I've heard you say that you don't think innovation no. is a straight line to success. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So that's surprising. So why not? So nobody likes to hear that, right? Like talking mm -hmm. about a joy kill in a room. So uh, here's the thing. Here's what we think. Let's start there. Hey guys, we got a challenge. We got an opportunity. Let's innovate. We innovate. So we're starting at the bottom of like the graph, right? We think it's going to be that straight linear line up to success. The minute we decide to innovate, it's all going to go well. Whether that decide to innovate is from a cultural perspective as a team or decide to innovate as a new product we want to launch into the market, right? We start here. We think it's a straight line. The reality is with innovation, it's not a straight line to success. It's actually a J curve. And I'll explain what I mean. You start here, right? Hey, let's innovate. 
then things actually get harder. And I'll give you an example around this in a minute. It gets harder. The naysayers come out, right? All the reasons to quit. I call them cave people. (laughs) Citizens against virtually everything. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. And now's their chance, right? They're like, shit, it's hard. Now's my (laughs) chance to like, you know, shut down Why are we doing this? Right, I am validated. So, So they come out. It's harder for a lot of reasons. But if you can get through the J curve, then you start to go upward and you start to reap all those amazing benefits of your hard work. So let me give you an example of the J curve so we can make it more than theoretical. So um, one of our great partners is a team um, called Footers Catering and the President Anthony. Now I will say, because we are recording this during all the coronavirus and they, it's a catering business and events world. They got hit right. hard. The world got pulled out from under him. And I will tell you that Even right now, in the throes of what he's in, the innovation and leadership that he's showing is phenomenal. So I I just want to give him a shout out for a second because he's in a tough time, but he's a partner of ours for a reason, and he will be stronger, and his team will be stronger on the other side because of his leadership and his team. They all know what type of innovators they are, and they all bring their best because of it. But let me share the story that he gave us. So he was talking about how they had a basically a manual ordering system where you mark down, we need two trucks, four serving platters, eight server, right? Like the list goes on. He said when they decided to shift from that to the software, he knew that it was going to be hard first. He knew at first they were going to be doing double the work. So they needed redundancy. So in the beginning, they had to input into the software. Things were going to be wrong. They had to fix what was wrong in the software because they had to test it and do it manually. So his team had to do double work. He knew that, right? He knew when that double work started, the naysayers would come out and go, oh my God, we, this is too much work. We should not be doing this. It's too much effort. Why are we making the change? What the we're doing work. fine. Right, exactly. But he knew that he had to get through that dip. He had to give us, he had to give his team, he had to set the expectations. So here's what he does. He's so brilliant. He gets up in front of his team and says, hey guys, we're doing this, but here's what I want you to know. It's going to be harder first. We're going to dip down. We're going to have to do double the work for a couple months while we work out the kinks in the system. And it's going to be frustrating. And I get it. But I promise you, if we stick together, we can get to the other side. And oh, by the way, while we're at the bottom, all of you who find holes in things, tell me, because that's how we're going to make it stronger. So Mm -hmm. now he's not only setting the expectations for the team that innovation is a J curve, we're going to dip down. He's also leveraging the people whose inclination is to be like, this is why it's not going to work to help him make it stronger. So to me, setting your team up for success with any innovation initiative, or actually any initiative in general, right, when you're trying to move things forward, is to set that expectation of the J-curve. Hey, it's going to get harder first. We're going to have some challenges that we didn't expect. We're going to have to deal with some things, maybe even do double the work, whatever your situation is. But if we can figure this out, we'll come through the other side and we'll see that acceleration up but you got to set that expectation. It's not a straight line. And the mistake that we make is A, thinking it, and B, even when we know that's not going to be the case, we don't communicate that to our teams. So they're not ready for the dip. And that dip is personally really frustrating and hard. I mean, we've all been there, right? Where oh, we, absolutely. Well, you and I have been there with our businesses, right? You launch a new idea, a new initiative, and it doesn't suddenly just take off Right. right. First are the challenges and the struggles and the lack. And yep. then Here's you the move thing that's it. not working. And the, you know what occurred to me as you were as you were talking about this is we can go through this. So you were t- the, the example that you gave with Footers Catering was this kind of large scale innovation yeah. and change that they made. Yep. Yeah, true. We can go through this on a daily basis with yes. little right, like with little things and it, thinking about mm. like tapping the the people on your team and their innovation styles. There are people are going to go through this at different times too, mm-hmm. and, Great point. And, in, and in different ways. So I think if we're really talking about like building these innovative teams, it's understanding and thinking about this J curve all the time, mm-hmm. and thinking mm-hmm. about what that response is going to look like from different people. And they might hit it at different points. You know, I might because I'm at a certain my role in in a large scale innovative change might be really early on or Mm -hmm. so really to that. So you brought up a really important point. There's actually, there's two parts that you brought up. Um, One is that we all play most valuable in different parts of the innovation. And I think what's important to understand in that is not just where you fit in, but that recognition that innovation 
is all across the spectrum. It's not just the front end blue skies. Let's figure this out. It's it, right. there's as much innovation in the implementation and the yes. assessment side as there is in the upfront side. Um, and we sometimes lose sight of that, right? We think innovation happens on the front end and then we execute, but that's actually not how it works. It happens all the time. But the other thing that you said that I, I want to just take a moment and share a story around is the fact that we all experience it a little bit differently. And when we understand the unique everyday innovator styles on our team, we can get through things stronger and better. So let me give you one example. Um, Morty is the leader's name, and he works at a large electronics reseller. So global company, they resell electronic parts, right? Business to business world. He leads a team of internal auditors. So not the sexy team, not the customer <laughs> facing team, right? These are internal auditors, right? These are people whose job is operational excellence on his team. That's what they do day in and day out. So we did, we did a workshop together, but the awesome thing that came out of it was, um, so first, we're doing all these exercises, right? They've now gotten to a place where they have trust and respect and the vulnerability is, is acceptable and they understand each other. So we got that out of the way, right? We got the foundation. He reaches up, he's a futuristic, by the way, mm -hmm. and he looks to the future and he goes, hey guys, I got a question for you. There's about 25 people in the room. He says, um, what's our biggest challenge? And I swear, like in unison, unison the whole team said getting the documents we need in time to do our jobs right so you can imagine they need other people inside the company to give them the uh -huh. documents so they can assess and audit they can't do it unless you give me give them the data i mean it was the funniest thing like i almost fell over laughing and they they always like yeah same we've always told them <laughs> it's like geez so he said because he's a futuristic he said hey what if we thought differently what if we look to the future to create the ideal scenario what would it look like down the road now, he's not going to solve this problem on his own because his head is going to the ideal world, but he needs help figuring out how to start it. He needs help making it better, right? He needs help looking at it differently. So he needs the other everyday innovator styles to complete his thought, mm. which happened in the room. So he does that. Then the collaborative stands up and goes, yeah, hey, guys, what if we all just, like, what do you guys think? Like, how about if we all pulled it together like, from our different perspectives? Because that's what the collaborative does, right? They're pulling it all together. Then someone who's a tweaker, editing and evolving, like you were talking about, stood up and said, hey, I have a thought. Um, what if we th asked a slightly different question, right? They adjusted the question. They said, hey, what if instead of solving the problem of how do we get our documents in time, what if we started by solving the problem of how do we have everything we need up front? Then the imaginative piped in, right? Then the instinctual piped in, and suddenly all these different perspectives were coming together to solve this problem. And hopefully they come out of it with a solution that saves them millions of dollars in time and resources. But it took all the different styles coming together to figure that out. And it's not because one person on their own isn't brilliant. It's because we only have a slice of the picture, right? And yeah, we need yeah. everybody else to pull it together. And I, I love, I just, I often think very fondly of that team because they were such a beautiful example of once they understood that, they became a team of high-performing innovators. Yeah. Okay. So I know we're going to dig in on this because you have so many tools around yeah. this. Um, but what's one of your favorites um, for unlocking innovation in your team? Yeah, so I'm going to give, you yeah, have so many. You're right. I'm like, where do I begin? <laughs> I mean, I have a book of it, a toolkit of it. Like, which one do you want? It's like picking um, your favorite child. <laughs> <laughs> Depends on what we're doing. Right. Um, if we're paying Monopoly, it's my youngest because he shares money with me under the table when my older one is like death by spoon. <laughs> when it's other things, it's my oldest because he's nicer to me at those moments. Yeah. Um, okay, so uh, my, my kids don't listen to my work podcast. They're like, <laughs> really, mom? Did you just admit that? Um, I want to share two with you, a tool with you called Look Always. And here's why I'm bringing this one up. And is because, this one in the book? Yes, this is in the book. Um, and But I bring this one up because of something you said in the beginning and we were talking about, which is thinking that like one way is going to do it. So we've got this room of people and all have to, different styles, right? Diverse room of people with different approaches and thinking, right? Different styles of innovation. And you had made the point, we can't just use one tool to access all of them, right? Or one way of thinking. So we developed this one tool that actually taps into all of them, but mm -hmm. at different times and in different ways. So it's called Look Always. So I'll give you the short kind of version of it so you could play with it if you're listening out there um, and understand it, but by the book, obviously, because it's in there in depth. Um, so instead of just asking one question, how do we improve this product? Let's just use that as our example, right? How do we improve our workflow? 
that taps the tweaker who's always about adjusting and evolving and editing, but it does not tap the imaginative who's mm. all about playing in the gaps. So we have it where you ask them how to improve, how to create, how to transform, how to disrupt, and how to worsen. Mm -hmm. So let me walk you through an example. Let's say it's a glass of water. How would I improve this glass of water? Right? Mm, or a lemon slice idea. in it. Perfect, right? I'd put lemon in it. I'd make it warmer, right? Like it's like incremental. No, no and that, uh, not warmer. <laughs> That's gross. <laughs> I don't know. Some people don't like ice in their cups. I don't understand that person, but whatever. Um, but you know what I mean? Like you can, but that takes you to a certain place. And there are certain everyday innovator styles that that question of improve is going to resonate with. I'm telling you, I've got 12 ideas, but I'm holding back because that's not the point of this podcast. <laughs> but as a speaker, I'm ready to go, right. girl. So for me, it does nothing. I'm like, see, I just said, make it warmer. Like I can't even think of anything good. <laughs> so for me, that doesn't work. So the next one is create right? How do I create? So create a new use for something, create a new use for the glass of water. So mm. now the imaginative is like, oh my gosh, it's for a vase. Oh, I can use it to water the plants. I can use it to um, see how hot it is outside, whatever, right. right? So the word create is going to speak to those type of people. Um, transform, turn that water into, turn something else into a glass of water. Meaning what else can I use to perform the same function as a glass of water, but I don't have a glass right? So what else would I use to do the same mm. thing? So the futuristic, the um, instinctual, is about connect dots, that type of question resonates with them. Um, disrupt, come up with the wildest, most disruptive, no handcuffs innovation you could possibly think of, like go wild. You better believe futuristics are all about this one, right? right that's so how the steam engine came about. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> and and I, took, I took water and now it powers this locomotive. Right, right. like something super so insane yep, that it couldn't yep. possibly be. And by the way, I'll just say very quickly, when we think about the businesses and brands that we love, the ones we spend our money on, they tend to be the ones that do it differently, that mm -hmm. like take something and make it wildly different. So there's a mm -hmm. lot of power, in, there's a lot of power in all of them, but yeah. I think in that one in particular. So the last one is the one that always surprises people, but it's amazing what, com what comes out of it and that's to make it worse. So for example, with a glass of water, and uh, here's something that actually a team actually did. So the team that was responsible for making the glass of water worse said, oh, we'll make it dirtier. Like you wouldn't want to drink it if it were dirty, right? But then they said, oh, well, if it's dirtier, I can use it to water all my plants. So, or if it's dirtier, I can use it in agriculture, or if it's dirtier, I can use it to power my car. So when you look at the, the challenge we have is we take the thing that we're dealing with, the challenge, the opportunity, and we ask one question. And not only does that only lead to one path of answers, it only taps into a couple types of people. Yep, yep, yep. So I want you to ask questions that are about improve, create, transform, disrupt, worsen, because not only are you going to get a, an entire range of new thinking you didn't have before, you're going to tap people in different ways. And you, it's almost like um, speaking to somebody in their native language. Yeah. So, oh, great. So yeah. let's, say, let's say I only speak English. And you are asking me a question uh, in Mandarin. I cannot answer that. Right. Right. But if I ask you a question <laughs> can, in English, I can sit. You got it. I can sit and smile and look at the rest of the team. Like <laughs> I support y'all. I love that. Right. But I can't answer. Yeah, that's but a great point. Really thinking of it as you're speaking in a language that somebody can understand. Yeah, and you know, here's the thing. So about, powerful. Here's the thing about people. We don't need to be right, but we need to be valued and heard. Yes. And it is hard to be valued and heard when you're not connecting with us to begin with. Yeah. So your team may not, well, there's really two reasons, right? In fact, if we have the time, we can talk about the innovation loop because that's really important in getting everybody's kind of to your point about being inclusive. But to start with, if, I, if you're not, if you're asking me to do something in a way that doesn't work for me and it's exhausting me and that is a struggle for me and that doesn't respect what I bring to the table, I don't feel valued and heard. Um, so I think we have to, as leaders, it's our job to work harder, to be more inclusive. Does it take some work? I mean, you know, you're in this business. Yeah, it takes some work. But man, is the payoff incredible. Oh, it's amazing. And, I, and, and also, when you start to tap that and have everybody understand, it becomes actually a shared responsibility. So, mm -hmm. right, mm -hmm. when, you, yeah. when you think about the fact that how you and I treat each other all day long, really, like, so if I understand how you innovate and I understand what you're bringing to the table 
And all of us on the team understand that. that it, it no longer, like making, and I'm doing air quotes, making the team innovative <laughs> right. is not the leader's responsibility. We all get it and, and we all see the benefit in it. And that's fitting personally. Right. And that's what happens when we on our team understand how our teammates innovate and the value that they bring and how we cause friction too. Yeah. We all own, we, first of all, we all own innovation from a personal perspective, but then to your point, we own that responsibility of tapping into the other people in the right way and they own it in how they communicate with us as well. And I think both are important. And, you know, um, as we said in the beginning, we're recording this in the middle of our lockdowns during coronavirus, right? And I will say that this is even, it's, I won't say more important, it is amplified in yes. times of uncertainty when people are stressed because now more than ever, your team needs to feel that their, import, their uniqueness and their value is something that is respected and brought to the table and they need to have ways to connect with their teammates, yes. in meaningful ways so they can move forward together. And, and what we've seen in our work and what I'm really proud of is the fact that while this is started as a business tool, it really is a personal empowerment tool in a lot of ways, just to sound a little bit cheesy, because it adds so much value and contribution and respect and understanding to ourselves and to the worlds that we play in. Oh, yeah. I mean, just thinking, I mean, anytime that we can show up and be seen, heard, valued, and see, hear, and value the people that we work mm -hmm. with, like, that really is, um, it's, it's pretty magical. Hey, let me ask you a question, because I think this relates to what we're talking about now. What are the top ways? So I was sharing earlier about the, let me ask you a clarifying question, Maureen. <laughs> let me ask you a clarifying question. Uh, help me understand. That was the right. other thing, which I sometimes use when I really mean it, but not because I'm trying yeah. to trick you, right? Yeah. Um, what have you seen of the top ways that leaders accidentally shut down inclusion? So we've talked about it a little bit kind of from my knowledge, but, but you're in this business. So I, I just want to hear for a second because I think it loops back to innovation. Well, I, think, I do think that one of the top ways is holding it as their responsibility. Only their responsibility. Uh-huh. Right. Mm -hmm. And that it's got to come and not equipping people with the tools, with the language, like common language is so important. Common yeah. tools are so important, which is what I love uh, about your work because you are giving people common language and common tools mm. um, and permission. So we, I know we've talked about these, but I can't emphasize enough how much psychological safety is. Yeah. Um, and so those leaders that shut it down are, they do not create that. So there's no room for mistakes. Yeah. Um, there is no room for um, learning and growth through mistakes. It's like, you know, and, and, right. and modeling behavior. And there's no very, room to look like you don't know the answer, right? Yes, right. Right. You have, yeah. like in all of this, you have to be okay saying, I, I'm not sure. I don't know. Let me, yeah. let's find this out together. Yeah. Because um, again, the, they shut down the curiosity right? So it's very dogmatic. Yeah. Um, you know, all think of any bad leader you've ever had, but those are some of the top ones like that psychological safety um, is, is foundational too. And here's one of the things I'd say about that. Um, I have two short stories. So uh, it's amazing when you are, have the years under your belt that I have, you've seen a lot of stuff, haven't we? Like, yeah. like good God, how, many, how much of this have I actually seen? So I, I was being interviewed for a podcast and the guy was sharing me. He worked for a very large company in the airlines industry. I'll just leave it there. And he was saying that, um, and this way relates to what you're saying in a second, but th actually this is going to blow your mind because I haven't actually shared this. Now I'm going to share it on recording and you are going to go like, you're going to fall over. Okay. Our, our audience, are you ready for this? Maureen's going to fall over. <laughs> so this was a conference about diversity and inclusion and they brought everybody into the town hall room, right? The auditorium, whatever it was. And the leadership was on stage. And you can imagine the leadership was all looked the same. Yep. And he was talking about the importance of diversity inclusion at the company. And he probably meant it, by the way. So let me just start Absolutely. by saying that he probably had very good yeah. intent. <laughs> I'm almost like horrified to say the next part of it. But this brave employee stood up. And went to the microphone. You know, you have like the microphones in the aisles, yeah, right? Yeah, so yeah. just really put herself in the spotlight. And she said, gosh, you know, I'm really thankful that we're doing this diversity inclusion um, efforts, but I'm curious, when I look on the stage, all I see are middle-aged white guys. So how is that diverse? He unfortunately made a comment back as trying to be funny that just killed oh, the entire room. So here's why I bring that up. 
she was right. And he had an amazing opportunity to go, oh my gosh, you're right. We're going to do something about that. Because I have no doubt he had good intentions. I, I really just want to say that doubly, right? But here's why I bring this up. When we talk about psychological safety, there's two things in that story that resonate to what we're talking about and building a team of innovators and being inclusive and diverse. She was brave enough to be the first person to stand up and ask the question that everybody was thinking. And I have no doubt moving forward in that company that there was more vulnerability and more space for those conversations, not because of the leader, but because of this employee that chose to ask the question and point out the obvious that everybody right. was thinking, but nobody wanted to say, right? For, of course, we don't want to say, we don't want, like, there's, you know, ramifications for that kind of stuff. But so my point with psychological safety and kind of that is, regardless of title, one of us has to stand up and, and say it, right? And yeah. she did. Yeah. Well, and that comes back. I know. To, I can't believe I haven't shared the story with you before. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh my. Uh, but it does show again that, that if we're, whether the lens that we're looking through is innovation and diversity of thought, yeah. um, it is everybody's responsibility. Yes. And I, and I, I share that story, not, not to throw this company under, no, under huh. the like bus or anything, but just it could to, be a million companies. Well, it could be a million. I'm not sure who they are, but, but, but also, right. Well, and also, right. It could be in a million places, <laughs> right. but also because like, it's all of our responsibility to create psychological safety to your yes. point. So yep. Google's done these incredible studies around teams that thrive. And the foundation of that is psychological safety, ability yep. to be vulnerable, ability to take risks, ability to be yourself, be authentic, like all of that. Right. So, but for that to happen, all of us. So I want to share an example on the other side for a second, because I don't want to leave it on that one. Cause that just leaves a bitter taste in your mouth. Doesn't it? It does for yeah. me. So um, I was working for a consumer packaged goods company. So think cleaning and all the stuff that you would find in the stores. And there was a team of VPs. So everybody that ran a brand. So this is billions of dollars of accountability in the room. And they were going around the room talking about their forecasts, right? So it was like the quarterly report or something like that. So the first person, you know, gets up there and starts peacocking, right? Like, oh, we've had these great numbers. Things are good. This is amazing. Blah, blah. The second person stands up and does the same thing. Like, we're fantastic. We've we tackle all these challenges. It didn't affect us. Blah, 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 right. All the way to a guy named Doug. And Doug was a leader that I always admired. I'd had the chance to work with him and he was just a stand up guy. So he stands up and he goes, well, here's the deal. We have a decline in our numbers. We're not really sure why, but we're going to dig into it. Our job in this next month is to figure out what's going on so we can turn it around. And in that moment of vulnerability, a weight was lifted in the room and suddenly everybody in the room is having a real conversation about what they're really dealing with in their business units. Right. He stood up and was the first to be vulnerable and the dominoes crumbled, like all the peacocking went away and everybody owned it. So here's the thing about vulnerability and trust and like diversity and inclusion. I think we desperately all want it, Absolutely. but somebody has to stand up first and do it. Yeah. Well, and I think there's the, um, you know, thinking about this, like nobody wants to be the jerk, right? Nobody right. is intentionally doing things. So thinking about, I'm gonna, again, I'm going to loop it back to the diversity of thought and innovation. It's saying as a leader or on your team, hey, we don't, we're going to make mistakes. Yeah. We're flat. It's what we do with those. Like somebody's yeah. going to say something or somebody's going to do something. Or we're going to shut somebody down or we're going to, um, we're going to, you know, poo-poo somebody's idea or this or that. It's what we do next that matters. Yeah, that's and very well said. Yeah, and as a team, we're committed to actually going there, right? And so that we can get to that end game where all of us are bringing our absolute gifts and talents and, and bringing our, you know, our triggers and our, because that's worth it. So yeah, we're going to get to the messy and they're 100% hundred mm -hmm. are going to make mistakes what do we do next? So if I'm a leader out there, I'm probably having the thought, like, I've made mistakes, okay, why aren't they making more? Like, why aren't they doing more innovation? And can I just give a little bit of advice on this part? Because this has been one of the most powerful lessons in our research over the last 10 years. You want to drive innovation on your teams, derive that diversity of thinking, build those high-performing teams, you've got to reward the behaviors, not the outcomes. Yes. So let me, yeah, so let me explain what I mean, right? So here's what happens oftentimes in teams. So, um, Maureen, congratulations. That new initiative that you tried totally worked. We're going to bring on those new clients. This is incredible. Everybody, we're going to get together for cake and Friday. This is exciting. Everybody Ooh. give Maureen a round of applause, right? So that's option one. Option two, 
hey, Mo, listen, I know that you tried really hard on that new process initiative, but it bombed. So here's what we're going to do. You and I are going to have a really long conversation. We belabor everything that went wrong. You're going to feel pretty crappy coming out of it. Then we're going to wrap up your fail- failure. We're going to put it on the shelf. And we're going to pretend like it never happened. Yes. And oh, by the way, you look exhausted. So I'm going to put you on some smaller projects so you can get your feet under you. So now here's just what your team is facing without even you meaning to do it, right? It's either cake on Friday or the failure shelf. Yep. That's like playing Russian roulette. So for all of us leaders, the question becomes, if my team is facing Russian roulette, how likely are they to come forward with innovative thinking? They're not. Why would they? That's a 50-50 so, odds. My first uh, boss out of college was the founder of Quad Graphics. Um, they are now the largest print company in the world. Mm. Yeah, I've heard of them. Um, we would not, you didn't know this at first. Um, you wouldn't get your bonus if you couldn't tell him how you failed. Oh, <laughs> I like it. Right? Brave. Right? Because it was, well, because it was saying, we're going to, we are going to make mistakes. And we're going to. And it's okay. And it's okay. And it's actually, it's rewarded because if you're, if we're not making mistakes, if we're not trying to innovate, if we're not iterating, we're going to look the same last year. And then they wouldn't be the large company that they are. Exactly. Um, We should do a whole different podcast. I have a whole chapters in my book about why failure matters to innovation. And it's not why we think it's not just why we think it's not just because we need to fail to iterate, to be taking risks. There's actually a lot more personal reasons why failure actually is important for all of us and our culture. But to loop it back to the behaviors for a second, for leaders out there, for teams that want to thrive, my suggestion, we have a whole list of different things to pull out in the book, is pick the top three behaviors mm. that you want to see, that you know drive innovation and that you know openness of thinking and all that in your team, and reward those publicly. So um, I'll give you yep. an example. Yep. So like maybe it's maybe it's speaking up when everybody is heading the other direction. Maybe it's taking risks. Maybe it's supporting someone else on your team, even when it doesn't serve you. Whatever it is, you decide. I have lists of it to help people, but. Point being, if you reward those behaviors, you'll get more of them, and then you'll get the innovation that you're looking for. Um, The outcomes happen anyway. And yes, it's important to recognize success when it happens, and it's important to recognize failure when it happens and learn from both. But you're not going to get to either of those in the way you want if you don't take a step back and reward behaviors. So pick the behaviors that matter to you and to your team and align them with your values and reward those. The teams that do that have incredible innovation day in and day out. And I'd like um, thinking about that, like back to the initial question, like why does this all matter? Yeah. Why does understanding and and unleashing the innovation potential in your team matter? So I think even just thinking about how we started the conversation about how to build high performance teams of innovators, you know, in this saying like reward the behaviors that you want to see, have people understand who they are, who their teammates are, how to bring that. Um, I feel like we could talk about this forever. Well, and let me, this is the last thing I'll say because we have to move on at some point. Yeah, leave us with one final thought. If you understand your everyday innovators, how your team innovates, you can reward them for doing the behaviors that are easy for them to do. So if you have an inquisitive Uh, on their team, reward them for asking questions. If you have a risk taker, reward them for getting uncomfortable. If you have an instinctual, reward them for finding the patterns and the insights. It actually becomes easier when you understand how they innovate, because you can reward them for the things that you want more out of them. And is it, does it take time and is it personal? Yeah, but as we keep saying, like the fruits of it are just incredible. So that's my ending thought is like, you can, make, you can take it to the black diamond level if you're willing to. Oh, right on. Oh, awesome. I, um, I look forward to our next conversation. Thanks for hanging with us on Inside Lawn Street. If you know someone that is truly ready to unlock their innovation advantage, have them join you on Lawn Street. Discover your innovation advantage. Build a team of high-performing innovators and ignite ideas and solutions that create massive impact. G-O-T-O, LawnStreet.com. Remember, innovators, if you don't take the leap, somebody else will.